What's going on, everybody? This is Nick from Part Time Pilot. This is episode number nine now of the Audio Ground School podcast, where I am going through the lessons of our online ground school for you to have for free in an audio format. I was just on a podcast recently and we were talking about the beauty and the importance of the audio media and how that it's different from video. A lot of people love video and I get it. You need that visual. But when you read something or you listen to it, your mind has to paint its own picture of what you're hearing or reading. And that can be very powerful because it makes your mind work a little bit more and figure it out in its own way. And the way that audio is better than reading is that it's way more convenient, right? You can listen to it while you're running, while you're walking, while you're driving. So audio is a very special format. So that's why I'm super excited about this podcast and doing these lessons. So that's enough of that. Let's get to it. We are going to lesson number 13. And again, this is in section two called operations of aircraft systems. This is still the first section that we've been doing. We're still finishing up operations of aircraft systems. We've got about six episodes or six lessons to go, which might take two, maybe three episodes. And section one of our online ground school is just an introduction. And we covered that in episode one. So we're in section two, operation of aircraft systems. And last episode, we covered fuel and oil system and aircraft engine. So if you missed that, go ahead and check that out. And today we're going to do lesson 13 on carb heat or carburetor heat. And if we have time, which I think we will, we'll get into lesson 14, which is on propellers. So let's start with carburetor heat. Okay, so carburetor heat is a very, very, very important thing on Venturi type carburetor fed engines. The danger is that a carburetor inlet can become clogged with ice. This can happen when flying through cold and wet atmosphere, but can also happen at almost any altitude in any weather that has moisture. Well, I'm going to repeat that. It can happen at almost any altitude in any weather that has moisture. You'll want to remember that for your examiner and your FAA written. In fact, carb icing can occur with an outside air temperature as high as 20 degrees Celsius and high relative humidity. This is because of the way a Venturi inlet works. Venturi inlets go from a large inlet to a squeeze much smaller, what they call a throat. So it's like a tunnel where it has a large inlet, large diameter inlet, and then a small diameter throat in order to compress the incoming air and create a positive pressure. This helps draw fuel into the airstream. So this is how they work. This is how they get fuel drawn up into the cylinders without, you know, against gravity is they, they're bringing air in and then they're compressing that air with this throat and that compressed air draws that fuel in with it and then it shoots the fuel air mixture up into the cylinders. This increase in pressure causes any water molecules that are in the air so if it's a humid day and there's water molecules in the air, the increased pressure causes it to freeze at a much higher temperature than we're used to. So water has a normal freezing point of about, you know, zero degrees C or 32 degrees F. But that changes, that gets much higher when you increase the pressure. So an increase in pressure causes any water molecules to freeze at much higher temperatures than we're used to. So that what it means is we can be flying in as high as 20 degrees Celsius and those water molecules in the air, if it's a high humidity day, can freeze once they go through the throat of the Venturi Inlet. If the carburetor becomes icy and clogged, there is no way for air and fuel to enter the combustion chambers of the engine and the engine will flame out and die out. Now, we don't want an engine out to happen. So what do we do to prevent this? Well, I present to you carburetor heat or carb heat. Carb heat should be used whenever carb ice is suspected. As long as you don't use carb heat during high power phases of flight, such as climb out, like we talked about in our last episode on, when we talked about engine problems, because carb heat is going to increase engine temperature, 
as long as you don't do that during high power situations, like again, like climb, the worst that can happen with car beat is you're going to get a loss of engine performance because that warm air, it's going to be less dense. And so you're going to lose that fuel to air mixture. Car heat comes from a shroud around the exhaust of the engine. So it's a metal shroud that kind of goes around the exhaust. And so air comes into kind of the engine compartment and it kind of passes over the exhaust and the exhaust is really hot. And then it's collected by the shroud. So the shroud kind of collects this warm air because again, it's around the exhaust pipes, which heats it up. And when the carpet is turned on, a valve opens and allows the air inside the shroud to be directed into the carburetor so that now, instead of taking just kind of normal air, oncoming air that might be cold into the carburetor, it takes this warm air, again, from that shroud around the exhaust and makes a pathway so that that air is now go- what the air that's going into the carburetor. When carb heat is turned off, this valve is simply closed. And again, we're just getting that sort of that kind of free stream air that's coming into the carb. Carb heat can be turned on inside the cabin on the instrument panel. On a Cherokee Warrior, this lever is usually to the right of the mixture lever. Carb ice is most commonly seen in low power settings moist atmosphere, and high altitudes. So I'm going to say that again because it's very important. Carb ice is most commonly seen in low power settings, moist atmosphere. Again, we talked, remember, when there's moisture in the atmosphere and you have that air coming in, that moist air coming in, and it goes through that Venturi tube, it's going to compress that air into a higher pressure and that moisture can freeze from that higher pressure. It freezes at higher temperatures. And then high altitudes, again, high altitudes is where it's usually colder. So again, you're going to get carb ice when you're up high, more likely. As engine power is reduced, airflow is restricted and ambient heat is lessened. So again, that's, we talked about low power settings. That's the reason why. So that makes low power setting flight, such as descents, more prone to carb icing because again, the airflow is restricted and the ambient heat is lessened. So you'll have just more, it'll just be colder air coming in. So you're more prone to carb icing at low power settings. Again, carb heat should be used whenever carb ice is suspected. I said that before, but I just want to repeat that. Carb heat should be used whenever carb ice is suspected. That might be something you see on the FAA written exam. If you see your engine RPM slowly decreasing, then your first thought should be carb ice. If you turn on your carb heat and see more of a drop in RPM before the RPM slowly starts to rise, then your suspicions of carb ice were correct. So you see a drop in RPM, slow drop in RPM. You turn on your carb heat, and if you see more of a drop in RPM, before it then turns around, the RPM turns around, slowly starts to rise, then your suspicions of carb ice were correct. The carb heat, when turned on, causes, again, that warmer, less dense air to flow through the carb into the cylinders. This warmer, less dense air enriches the mixture because less dense, less air. So you have the fuel to air ratio, you have more fuel that enriches, that's what we call enriching the mixture. Again, because less air is entering the engine. But the fuel entering the engine remains the same. So again, that that ratio changes. This warm air plus the water from melted ice causes the engine RPMs to drop. So we have a drop because the ice is clogged. So ice is clogging that Venturi tube. We're getting less air. So our fuel to air ratio is off. We're getting less power. So our RPM goes down. Then we turn on carb heat. That warm air plus the water from the melted ice then goes into the engine and we're going to see that RPM drop a little bit more because of that. Then once that that water and all the ice is cleared, it'll just be that warm air and you should see the RPM rise again. At this point, the pilot can remove car peat, but they want to keep a sharp eye on the RPM and avoid clouds and moist air. So if that happens once, Wherever you're flying, 
it's likely to happen again. So you really want to keep an eye on it. You don't want to leave Carpeat on all the time because, again, we mentioned the dangers of doing that in like climbs and high power scenarios. But if you if that happens, might be a good idea. I know that I would. I don't like taking any chances. I would return to the airport. I would keep keep my car beat on as often as I can, especially when I'm kind of coming in to my landing, which that's part of the landing checklist. And that, again, is one of the reasons why it's part of the landing checklist because of those low power settings. You don't want to get iced up on landing. Float type carburetor systems are more susceptible to carburetor icing in comparison to a fuel injection system. So float type carburetor, that's what we were talking about when we just say carb carburetors. Is we call that a float type carburetor system rather than a fuel injection system, which you have on fancier aircraft or newer aircraft. And they're more susceptible to carb icing because of the pressure increase which the air undertakes inside the Venturi tube, which we talked about. You still can get ice from, again, things like pressure increases with, with moisture or just cold air and, and cold weather in fuel injection systems. But again, they're less susceptible. When flying a fixed pitch propeller and a float type carb, the first indication of carb ice is the loss of RPM that we talked about. So again, a couple things I want to reiterate. Again, float type carb systems, so carburetor systems are more susceptible because of that venturi tube than like a fuel injection system. And then when you're flying a fixed, fixed pitch prop and a float type carb, the first indication is gonna be that loss of RPM. So that's that's kind of how you know. The loss of RPM is indicative of a carburetor clogged with ice such that your fuel air mixture is increasing or becoming enriched due to the fact that it's getting less air. We talked about that already, but again, I just want to reiterate that. In this situation, if a pilot were to turn on carburetor, they should expect to see continued and slow loss of RPM for the first minute or so. Because the ice is being melted and water is entering the combustion chambers, causing poor performance. Then the RPM should gradually start to increase once the ice has been burned off. However, because the air being used is now hot carburetor heat air, the pilot should not expect to see RPMs as high as they would in normal conditions. In this situation, a pilot should avoid climbing, if possible, and divert to the closest possible airport. So again, kind of stuff we already talked about, and we did talk about it, but I wanted to reiterate this because this is an audio podcast, and so if you're driving, you won't have to rewind again. Float type carbs are more susceptible when flying a fixed pitch and a float type carb. First indication is that loss of RPM. And then when you see that loss of RPM, you're going to turn on carpy and you should see more of a loss of RPM before it starts to slowly rise up. It'll never get back to what it was before. Again, because that hot air is less dense that you're putting in there from the carb heat. And then again, you should avoid if you need to keep that on, which again, like I said, I would. You want to avoid climbing in high power situations and divert to the nearest closeable airport. As mentioned previously, the use of car peat during high power settings like climb can cause detonation in the engine cylinders due to a high temperature air entering the cylinder. Car peat also decreases engine performance in any stage of flight because the hot air entering the cylinders now has lower density compared to cooler air. So you also lose performance. Again, we kind of already mentioned this, but I just want to reiterate it again. The lower air density increases or enriches the fuel air ratio, more fuel per air molecule, which decreases the engine performance. That's pretty much like density altitude, right? So if we have a high density altitude, we know that that decreases engine performance. So this is the same thing. We're just pumping less dense air into our engine. So if you're in the online ground school, go to go back a lesson to lesson 12, the aircraft engine and check out that video. We'll show you what a carb looks like on an actual aircraft engine and that shroud of the carb heat around the exhaust. And then in lesson 13 on carb heat, at the bottom of the lesson is a diagram, a schematic of a float type carburetor. So it shows you the air inlet and then it shows you where the carb heat is. It shows you the different valves like the throttle valve that has air and fuel going into the cylinders. It shows that Venturi throat inlet where you where carb ice would build up. And then it shows you kind of the float valve 
when the fuel comes in through the strainer, all that stuff. So it's it it's a hard one to explain over audio. So you're just gonna have to go take a look at that. And as I said, if you are listening, you're not in the online ground school, you can actually go back to the last episode of the podcast. We put in the show notes a video of the aircraft engine. So that you can go check that out and we'll show you what an actual carb looks like and what that shroud looks like. So you can go check that out. All right. So, and then also if you're in the, in the online ground school, go ahead and take that quiz on the carb heat lesson. That's lesson 13. And let's continue on to lesson 14. Now lesson 14 is going to be on the propeller. So let's pull that up and let's get started on propellers. Tell you all about the different type of propellers you'll see as a student private pilot and what it is and what's important about each that you need to know. All right, so this is, again, this is lesson 14 of section two on the propeller. In general aviation and most aircraft used by private pilots, there are usually two possible types of propellers that you'll find. One propeller is called a fixed pitch propeller in that the blades of the propeller do not change their angle of pitch. So they're always the same angle. They're rigid. This is the most common type of propeller and the only propeller I've actually ever flown with. Fixed pitch propellers are great and simple, but are only optimized for one phase of flight, usually climb or cruise. You see, the angle the propeller blade makes with the relative wind changes how effective the propeller is at producing thrust. This angle is called the angle of attack for the propeller. Just like the angle of attack on a wing, the angle of attack on the propeller is just the angle between the relative wind and the propeller cord line. A propeller is essentially an airfoil that creates lift in the horizontal direction, thrust. The optimal angle for the propeller blade changes depending on what you want the aircraft to do. If you want it to climb best, cruise best, descend best, etc. This means that a fixed pitch propeller is best in only one phase of flight while at the same time lacking performance in the other phases. The other type of propeller is called a constant speed or variable pitch variable pitch prop and it tries to solve the problem of an ever-changing optimal blade angle now in the online ground school you can take a look at this blade angle it's so when we talk about the relative wind and the angle of attack of a wing the relative wind is coming at our face as we're sitting in the cockpit and it's clear that the the angle of the wing is is an angle off of that that wind coming to our face But the relative wind for a propeller is what the propeller, the air the propeller is cutting through. So it's on the plane that the propeller is spinning. So you kind of have to to move that plane. It's the same thing. Propellers are just airfoils, but they're spinning around the propeller plane rather than cutting through the air like a wing does. So let's see if I can come up with a better way to explain that. Again, if you're in the ground school, just go into the lesson and take a look at this picture. You can see it shows you the blade angle. It shows you the propeller angle of attack, which is the angle between the propeller and the the propeller cord line and the relative wind of the propeller. And it also shows you the helix angle, which is the angle of the relative wind and the sort of vertical line, the vertical plane of your aircraft, which is perpendicular to your forward velocity and your thrust vector. So, and that's also called the rotational velocity plane. So you have the rotational velocity plane, you have the relative wind, and then you have the chord line. And those three lines make up the different angles that we talk about. So to explain what the propeller angle of attack is, Imagine you're like a giant and you just rip the wings off of your aircraft. Again, the wings have these airfoils. And then you were to just, you know, fashion, tie these wings to to a nose cone, <laughs> right? And then you spin this nose cone. So you're making a, a giant airplane for you and you're using wings as your propeller blades. And then so you have one wing on one side of the nose cone and one wing on the other. And then you... When you spin that, those airfoil wings are going to cut through as they spin. They're cutting through air 
differently. They're doing it rotationally on that rotational plane rather than gliding through in the direction of your forward velocity, right? So the angle of angle between where they're spinning and that relative wind is the propeller angle of attack. So you have those wings on the nose cone and they're spinning around and that cord, the cord line of the wings, the angle it makes with the relative wind that it's spinning through. So again, not the forward, the relative wind that we have coming into our face when we're sitting in the cockpit, but on that rotational plane, the rotational velocity plane that we talk about. So again, a little tough one to kind of visualize, but go check that out if you're in the online ground school. And let's get back. So we talked about the fixed pitch prop. So a variable pitch prop tries to change this problem of the ever-changing optimal blade angle. Again, because that propeller angle of attack, it's better to have a different angle of attack depending on what phase of flight you're in. Each blade on a constant speed propeller is able to rotate and change its blade angle. So again, constant speed propeller is also called a variable pitch propeller. And it's each one is able to rotate and change its blade angle. This means a pilot can operate the angle of the blades before entering certain phases of flight to ensure optimum performance in each phase. The advantage of a constant speed prop is that it permits the pilot to select a blade angle for the most efficient flight performance. I'm going to say that again because it's something you want to remember for your exams. The advantage of a constant speed propeller is that it permits the pilot to select a blade angle for the most efficient performance. When you change the pitch of the blades, you are effectively allowing it to reach higher RPMs in times when it usually cannot and lower RPMs in times when it usually cannot. For example, if the aircraft is pitched up so, such that it increases the angle of the blades with the relative air, this will cause more stress on the blades because they are cutting through more air with a dolar blade. The blade is at a dolar angle and you're cutting through that air rather than slicing through it. This added stress makes it harder for the propeller to spin through the air and it decreases the RPM while increasing stress on the propeller shaft and the engine. It also causes the engine to work harder, like I just mentioned, and the engine manifold cylinder pressures to increase. Again, more stress on the engine. If you are able to change the pitch of your propeller blades such that you are slicing through the air more with less stress on the blades and not reducing your RPM, then you can avoid this high manifold pressure situation high manifold pressure situation, which is good since high manifold pressures can lead to engine issues. This is why a precaution for operating engines equipped with a constant speed propeller is to avoid high manifold pressure settings with low RPM. So I want to say that again. A precaution for operating engines equipped with a constant speed propeller is to avoid high manifold pressure settings with low RPM. To do this, to, do, to avoid overpressurizing the cylinders of your aircraft with a constant speed propeller, a pilot should always change the propeller setting for higher RPM before increasing throttle and always reduce the throttle before changing the propeller setting for lower RPM. So I'm going to say that again. To avoid overpressurizing the cylinders of your aircraft with a constant speed propeller, a pilot should always change the propeller setting for the higher RPM before increasing throttle and always reduce the throttle before changing the propeller setting for low RPM. In other words, if you add throttle before making the propeller blade angle relative to the oncoming air less so that they can spin more freely in the air, you can overstress the engine by overpressurizing it. The same can be said if you change the propeller blade angle such that it increases with respect to the oncoming air before you decrease the throttle because the combination of high throttle and high stress on the blades will cause this overpressurization. All right, so that has been, again, the difference between a fixed pitch prop and a variable pitch prop. And then we talked about the operation of a variable pitch prop and the things you want to remember, again, for your FAA exam, and the things you want to remember to avoid the dangerous situations of high manifold pressure. So if you're in the online ground school, go ahead and take that quiz, take a look at the diagram 
look through, reread through the lesson and, and try and jot down the bold points in the lesson, take that quiz, and then we can move on from here. And that takes us to the next lesson of section two, which is lesson 15 on antennas. This is another quick lesson, so we might even be able to get through this one and get to lesson 16 on ELTs. We'll see. So let's get to the antennas. Another important set of instruments a pilot must understand is the avionics, that the avionics you use inside the cockpit. Most of those have an antenna to pick up the signals outside the aircraft so that they can work. So during your pre-flight inspection, you want to check to make sure they're not damaged, they're not missing, because... It's very critical for these instruments inside your cockpit to work. They need to have their antennas, and their antennas need to be working correctly. So the first set of antennas you want to check for are your COM1 and 2 antennas. These are your communication radio antennas, or just your radios, that you use to talk to ATC, flight service stations, ground control, and all that. So you're going to have two radios, and you're going to have an antenna for each radio. So we call those COM1 and 2. On a Cherokee Warrior in a Cessna 152-172, these are found on the top of the fuselage pointing back at a slight angle. There should be one for each communication radio in the aircraft cabin. So again, that's why we look for two. The next antennas we want to talk about, the VOR antennas. On a Cherokee Warrior in Cessna 152-172, these are found near the top of the vertical stabilizer pointing backwards, sort of in a V-shape. So you have one on the left side of the vertical stabilizer and one on the right side and they're pointing backwards off the aircraft vertical tail and those are your VOR antennas so you want to make sure that those are still on there and not damaged and then we have the transponder antenna on a Cherokee Warrior and most other aircraft the transponder is usually found below the fuselage in the middle right around the pilot seat and is sometimes covered by a small bubble or like a fin something aerodynamic to protect it and and make it again more aerodynamic the actual location of these antennas may differ from the descriptions i just mentioned for your training aircraft so be sure to ask your flight instructor to verify what each antenna is for your aircraft and if there are more antennas that i mentioned like i said these are just the bare minimum you want to know what those do every single thing on your aircraft you want to know what it does and what it's for so that you can know if it's damaged, if it's acting up, then right, what you need to do for that and how you can correct for that and all that. All right, so that that's it on antennas. Let's just keep chugging right along to lesson 16 on the ELT. So again, we're in section two and we're getting close to the end. It has 17 lessons. So lesson 16 is on the ELT and that stands for emergency locator transmitter or emergency transmitters, and they're carried aboard most general aviation aircraft. ELTs are designed to transmit a distress signal in the event of an aircraft accident. The signals are broadcast on frequencies 121.5, 243.0, and even 406.0 for the newer ELTs. And this is megahertz frequency. So those are all megahertz, just like the frequencies that we, you would use for your radio. Those are the ones that the ELT use as a standard. The antenna for ELTs are usually found on top of the fuselage and resemble a stick with a ball on its end. So I didn't mention this in the antenna, which maybe I should have. I didn't mention the ELT antenna in the antenna lesson because I knew we would get to it now. But there's also an antenna for ELTs, and they're usually found on the top of the fuselage, usually towards the back of the aircraft, because the ELT is usually stored somewhere near the baggage compartment. But again, it could change on your aircraft, so make sure you know where it's at on your aircraft and what which antenna is the ELT. And it resembles a stick with a ball on its end, usually. And on Cherokee Warrior or Cessna 152-172, this antenna is a single antenna, usually found after the two COM antennas on top of the fuselage. So usually behind those, more after those. And if you're on the online ground school, we have a picture of it. So you can take a look at kind of see what that looks like. ELTs are designed to be triggered to broadcast after an impact. They may also be activated manually using an ELT switch in the cockpit. Some pilot checklists have steps to ensure the ELT has not been activated after each flight. I suggest performing this if a particularly hard landing was made. 
In order to check whether or not your ELT has activated, you can monitor 121.5 or 243.0 before engine shutdown. ELTs operate with their own batteries, which may or may not be rechargeable depending on the ELT. An ELT battery is required to be replaced or recharged either when the transmitter has been used for more than one cumulative hour or when 50% of the battery's useful life has expired. The half-life date of the battery will be determined by the manufacturer, and pilots can find it located on the ELT casing itself or in the aircraft's logbook. Now, this is a requirement for your ELT, which we'll get to when we talk about inspections and required equipment, but it's good to know and talk about now that those sort of things are things you'll have to check for in the logbook and make sure your ELT is up to date on those things. All right, so that has been ELTs. There is a quiz for this lesson. So if you're in the online ground school, go take that quiz. And we're going to keep chugging along. We're making real good progress. We got a couple short lessons here towards the end of this section. And our last lesson is lesson 17, and that's landing gear. And this is going to finish section two, operation of aircraft systems. So again, this is our last one, lesson 17 of section two on landing gear. Let's get to it. Let's finish this baby off. All right. So most small aircraft will have fixed gear, meaning that they are always down and there are no servos to retract them. This causes more drag, but the aircraft manufacturer has traded the drag for the added weight of the servos and power required to raise and lower the landing gear. It is obviously important to know whether your landing gear is fixed or not. Most Trainer aircraft like the 152, 172, or the Cherokee Warriors have fixed gear, and they do not retract up into the aircraft. And it's also important to know the wheel arrangement, whether it's a tricycle gear or a tail dragger, again, because it, your certificate is going to change whether it's a tail dragger or tricycle gear. And if you, ha if you train in one, you're going to have to be proficient and train in the other as well. They're kind of different ratings. You can get add-ons for a tail dragger, which we'll, we'll get to, we'll get to a little bit of that a little later uh, when we talk about other certificates and stuff. You also want to know the strut type and the abilities of the nose wheel steering. If it has it, a Cherokee warrior is a tricycle gear. So Cherokee warrior and the Cessna 152, 172 is what we call a tricycle gear. And it has two main wheels and a nose. The two main wheels are under the wing and then the nose wheel is below the nose. The struts are damped by oil and nitrogen, and that's something you'll want to remember for your aircraft. I'm not sure if this is an FA written exam question. It might be, but it's something that you'll definitely need to know for your check ride. Your examiner might ask you how your struts are damped, and they're damped by oil and nitrogen. And the nose wheel is steerable, usually for a Cherokee Warrior, 30 degrees in each direction. That means the nose wheel when you use the rudder pedals and you're taxiing to steer, the nose gear can go 30 degrees to the right or 30 degrees to the left to help you steer during taxi. Another important thing to know is the pressure required for the wheels. For a Warrior, the mains require 24 PSI and the nose requires 30 PSI. This is important for the scenario where you're performing your pre-flight checklist and you notice one of the wheels are low and require air. This actually happened to me a lot. They can fluctuate especially with if you have an aircraft that's being used a lot by a lot of students and you have temperature fluctuations and thus the density of and pressure of the air is going to change with those temperature fluctuations and you'll get these kind of wheels to look deflated sometimes. So it's important to know what those requirements are. So when you do your pre-flight check, especially with your check ride, you want to know what those are and sound smart and have the right pressure in your tires because Tires are a little bit important when you're coming in for landing. At most airports, you'll be able to call a fuel truck that has compressed air to fill your tanks. When they get there, it's important to know what the value of pressure is for each of your wheels so that you can kind of oversee what they're doing. A lot of these guys are great and they know what they're doing, but you are the pilot in command. So you have final say of what of everything that goes into your aircraft. So you need to know these numbers and make sure that you're watching them do this so that you know exactly what they're filling it up to. You wouldn't want to have a wheel pop because it's overpressurized as you come in for landing, and you wouldn't want to have one wheel that's flat or something that's dragging you to one side while you're taking off for landing. 
And again, to find this information for your aircraft, look in your aircraft's POH, your pilot operating handbook, or approved flight manual, AFM. Some aircraft may also include wheel fairings. Wheel fairings are shrouds that surround the front of the wheels. So it's just like skin of the aircraft that they've put and made sort of a shroud around the front of the wheels of the landing gear on landing gear that does not retract with the goal of reducing the drag made by the landing gear. So when you just have these struts down with these wheels, the air, it's going to, they create a lot of drag. So if they kind of make these shapes of aircraft skin that aren't too heavy to kind of make these wheels and struts aerodynamic, they're going to decrease the drag a little bit and it'll improve the performance of your aircraft, the fuel performance and climb performance and all that of your aircraft because you, you have less drag. And we'll get to drag and, and lift and all that stuff with aircraft performance in a later lesson. But that's what those four, so if you see those kind of shrouds around the wheels on some aircraft, but not on others, that's the reason why. Okay, so that has been landing gear. That's lesson 17. There is no quiz for this one. There's usually not a lot of questions, or there's actually usually no questions on the FAA written, but there are questions you'll probably get from your examiner during your pre-flight check, so it is good to know this stuff for your check ride and for being a safe, competent pilot. All right, so that that's it, guys, that we finally got through Section 2, Operation of Aircraft Systems. You know, it took a little bit longer than I thought. I When I started this podcast, I wasn't quite sure, you know, how much talking it was going to take, how long it was going to take me, but we did it in nine episodes. We did 17 lessons in Section 2, Operation of Aircraft Systems. So great job if you've made it this far with me. Really proud of you. If you're following along in the ground school, good job doing your quizzes, reviewing your lessons. If you're not following along in the ground school, we have 17, sorry, 16 more sections. No, we do have 17 more sections in the online ground school. So we're just at the beginning. You still have a chance to follow along. And I believe that will give you the best chance to pass your exams, both your written and your check ride. If you follow along both with the audio, you watch the videos, you read the lessons, and you take the art quizzes, and plus you get all the bonus content that we talked about, and the practice tests, and one-on-one, and our live lessons, all that stuff. So if you're not following along in the ground school, you can go to www.parttimepilot.com and just click online ground school up in the lesson. So next episode that'll be episode what did i just say this is episode nine so episode 10 we're going to start section three which is all about pilot certifications qualifications and regulations so we'll start with lesson one which talks about the definitions of categories classes and types of aircraft and then we'll get into lesson two which talks about your certificates and then we'll even get in probably maybe i'm not sure but we'll even get into Lesson 3, Pilot and Command. And then after that, probably in the next episodes, we got Pilot for Higher Limitations, Alcohol and Drugs, Incidents, Accidents, and Emergencies, FAA Advisory Circulars, Other Airmen Certificates and Ratings. Remember I mentioned the tail dragger stuff. Formation Flight and Dropping Objects Out of Your Aircraft. So that's all Section 3, Pilot Certifications, Qualifications, and Regulations, which we will start in episode number 10 next week.